all the warlike peoples of history, few have earned such a brutal reputation as the Assyrians. Hailing from part of Mesopotamia, roughly in modern-day Iraq, the Assyrians forged a series of empires that were some of the great powers of the ancient world. The greatest of these empires was the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which existed from the late 10th to the late 7th centuries BC. In its day, it was the largest empire the world had yet seen, stretching from Egypt to Syria, from the Levant back into Mesopotamia. Today, we explore the brutal punishments inflicted on enemies, rebels, and criminals in order to build and sustain this mighty empire and learn why the Assyrians have their fearsome reputation. But before we tell you how the Assyrians forged their empire, we want to tell you about a very different kind of forge that sponsored this video. Serpent Forge makes handcrafted jewelry from solid sterling silver with plenty of awesome designs based on mythology, history, anime, and video games. Serpent Forge offers dozens of intricate designs to choose from with a wide collection of rings, pendants, cuffs, and more. Their designs are seriously impressive and look great for any occasion, and they're sure to make a great conversation starter. We especially love how Serpent Forge takes inspiration from all over the world. From Princess Mononoke to the Nemean Lion, Serpent Forge's range of top quality designs are unrivaled, and there's certain to be plenty of things that catch your eye. Like many other ancient powers, the Bronze Age collapse of the 12th and 11th centuries led to a decline in the power of the long-standing Assyrian state. It was not until the reign of King Adad-Nirari, 912-891 BC, that Assyria bounced back in what modern historians call the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Merari reconquered many of the lands once lost, including Babylon. But it was his successors, especially Ashur Naspiral II, 884 to 859 BC, who turned Assyria into a superpower. Ashur Naspiral extended Assyrian power into the Levant and Canaan. Other great kings like Tiglath Pilazar III and Esarhaddon would conquer Syria and even Egypt for a time. These conquests required significant military resources. The armies of Assyria were called the hosts of the god Assur, named after Assyria's patron deity, who also gave his name to the traditional Assyrian capital of Assur. These armies were comprised of foot soldiers, archers, charioteers, and advanced siege equipment that made Assyria the deadliest military force the world had yet seen. The Assyrian army crushed countless foes on the battlefield or slaughtered them in the streets of the cities they conquered. Inevitably, these conquests involved massacres, looting, rape, executions, and slavery, as with all ancient empires. But why are the Assyrians seen as uniquely brutal compared to other empires? Monuments and inscriptions from the time show the Assyrians inflicting and celebrating unusually horrific punishments that have earned them a sinister reputation. One inscription from the palace of King Shenasherib II captures the brutality of a typical Assyrian conquest and the way in which the Assyrians took pride in, I cut their throats like lambs, my horses plunged into their blood like a river, I filled the plains with the blood of their warriors as if they were grass. Assyrian inscriptions provide a long list of horrible punishments inflicted upon those who dared stand in the way of Assyrian ambitions. One of the most common forms of punishment for conquered foes was impalement. Many sources show soldiers and even kings being impaled for all to see. Assyrian impalement was designed to be simple and efficient. Spikes were driven through the chest, killing the victims rather quickly. Sources describe how these impaled victims were left standing outside the conquered cities as a warning to survivors and as symbols of the complete dominance of the Assyrians. In at least one case, Tiglath Pilazar III had the king of a city impaled outside the front gate after his defeat. Mutilation was another common punishment. Often, it would be combined with impalement. Reliefs from the reign of Shalmaneser III show prisoners being impaled on stakes after having their hands and feet cut off. These were not the only body parts that the Assyrians used to inflict their punishment. Again, from the reign of Sennacherib II, Assyrian sources describe how men were castrated, with one inscription claiming that the Assyrians tore out their privates like the seeds of cucumbers. Decapitation was another popular Assyrian tactic, although this also served a practical effect. Decapitated heads were a reliable way to count the dead after a battle. The Egyptians had a similar practice, except they used hands rather than heads. 
One of the most famous episodes of decapitation occurred to the Elamite king Toyman. In 653 BC, the Assyrian army defeated and killed Toyman on the banks of the Ule River. However, this was not enough for the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Toyman's head was sent to Assur where it could be displayed as a symbol of dominance. In an infamous relief now in the British Museum, a scene shows Ashurbanipal and his wife having a banquet, and nearby, hanging from a tree, is the decapitated head of Toyman, hardly the most appetizing decor for a feast. Next among the parade of torturous punishments was flaying. Flaying involves the tearing off of a victim's skin in an excruciating ordeal that could leave the victim alive for hours. As with impalement, flayed victims could be displayed as warnings to survivors or potential rebels. At Sais in Egypt, for example, the Assyrians claimed to have had all those guilty of fighting against them flayed and their skins hung up around the city walls. Perhaps the most infamous of all Assyrian punishments was burning. Multiple kings claimed to have burned enemies alive throughout Assyrian history. Burning was a uniquely cruel way to die in the Mesopotamian world, as it was believed that burning deprived the dead of their afterlife. To burn someone then was to inflict a uniquely cruel death, and so it is no surprise that the Assyrians sometimes employed it. Ashurnasparal II was the most prolific king in this regard. At Tella, a city in the Upper Tigris region, Ashurnasparal records how he burned many captives. Most cruel of all were the children, both boys and girls, that he executed in this way. Ashurnasparal claims to have had children burned on at least six occasions, most of them rebels of the groups the Assyrians considered to be uncivilized. Some historians have argued that the burning of children had special religious connotations to the Assyrians, since some inscriptions seem to indicate that these children were specifically burned as an offering. Whatever the reason, the brutality is undeniable. Even the dead were not spared punishment for the sins of their descendants. Some scenes show captives being forced to grind up the bones of their comrades and families, another way of depriving the dead of an afterlife before being executed themselves. After the conquest of Susa in 647 BC, Ashurnasparal had the tomb of the ancient Elamite kings desecrated and took their bodies back to Assyria so that they could never again rest in their homeland. It is impossible to deny the brutality of the Assyrian Empire. From burning children to flaying kings, the Assyrians unleashed unimaginable suffering upon their enemies. How did such a brutal people manage to sustain an empire? Despite many atrocities, the Assyrians could be merciful. For example, the king of Dayenu, a small kingdom in Anatolia, was spared by Tiglath-Pileser I so long as he agreed to obey Assyrian authority and accept the power of the god Assur. In fact, anyone, no matter their ethnicity, could expect decent treatment if they submitted to Assyrian authority. Egyptian, Syrian, Canaanite, or otherwise, all were counted among the Assyrians once they became part of the empire and no legal distinctions were made on the basis of nationality. Of course, slaves were beneath free citizens, and women were beneath men, but this was true for all societies in this period. Being equal before Assyrian law did not mean that people were spared cruel punishments. Like many contemporary legal codes, Assyrian justice was harsh, and often used physical violence as atonement for crimes. Thieves could expect to be mutilated or killed for their crimes, and runaway slaves were certainly not treated with a light hand. In the Code of Asura, dated to the 11th century BC, many of these punishments are outlined. One unusual clause described what happened to a woman who injured a man's testicle. For the first offense, a woman would have her finger cut off. However, if she did it again, her eyes would be gouged out. Other gender-specific brutality was seen in response to abortion. To induce a miscarriage, as the Assyrians called it, was a terrible crime. The woman would be put on trial, and if found guilty, she would be impaled and her body would be denied a burial. Even if the woman died while attempting to abort her child, her body would still be impaled and left to rot. Clearly, brutality could be a feature of life for anyone, Assyrian or not, who dared break the law. The massive Assyrian Empire was built with cruelty, and so it was always at risk of rebellion from disgruntled subjects. Indeed, the Assyrians faced numerous rebellions throughout their empire and deployed their brutal punishments to deal with rebels or those suspected of having rebellious tendencies. 
Forced resettlement and mass deportations were a favorite method of controlling rebellious populations. It is estimated that as many as 5 million people were forcibly relocated during the Neo-Assyrian Empire. These deportations usually occurred in groups of thousands. In 744 BC, 65,000 people were forcibly relocated from a rebellious region of Iran and resettled on the banks of the Diyala River. Deportation split up rebellious people in newly pacified regions, reducing the number of potential rebels in any given place. By spreading out subversive elements, the Assyrians could more easily control them. Taking people away from their homes and sacred lands and relocating them reduced the chance of nationalist revolts that rallied around symbols like temples or around claims to an ancestral homeland. Relocation also allowed the Assyrians to move potential labor and agricultural workers into areas that needed it. The system was successful in pacifying some rebellious peoples, but it certainly broke traditional communities that might have lived in their original sites for centuries. However, it was not enough to stop every rebellion. Many people did revolt against Assyrian authority and, in response, the Assyrians inflicted monstrous cruelty to punish the rebels and discourage anyone else from following in their footsteps. To rebel against the Assyrians was not simply a political act. The Assyrians saw their empire as a divinely sanctioned order. To go against the empire was to stand against the gods, and that deserved to be punished. One of the most unusual rebellions the empire faced came in the reign of Ashurnasparal II. In 882 BC, the Assyrian inhabitants of the region of Halzilua rebelled against the king. This is one of the only instances where ethnic Assyrians revolted against the monarch, which made it an especially insulting rebellion to Ashurnasparal. Such a rebellion was taken as proof that these Assyrians were uncivilized and had been corrupted by non-Assyrian influences. This legitimized the incredible cruelty with which Ashurnasparal suppressed the rebellion. Ashurnasparal had all of the inhabitants of Kinabu, one of the region's fortified cities, burned, women and children included. This was the ultimate insult and proof that although Assyria would welcome anyone into the empire, it would not hesitate to eradicate you if you resisted their authority. Another area that frequently incurred the wrath of Assyria was Babylon. The historic city had been subjugated by the Neo-Assyrian Empire almost immediately and chafed under its control for centuries. The city attempted to rebel and establish independence several times, usually seizing upon periods of warfare or civil strife in Assyria as opportunities to free themselves. In 689 BC, after allying with the Elamite kingdom, Muzes ibn Marduk declared himself king of Babylon and attempted to rebel. Sennacherib II marched on the city and subjected it to a nine-month siege. The Assyrians spared no quarter for the rebellious Babylonians. A massacre ensued, temples were burned, statues of the gods were destroyed, and the Assyrians supposedly diverted the Euphrates River into the city to destroy parts of it. Muzazib Marduk himself was killed, although the details of what exactly happened to him are lost. It took years to rebuild, but Babylon would again be at the center of a revolt in the 660s and 650s BC. The Assyrian king, Esarhaddon, appointed his eldest son, Shamash Shum Ukin, to rule as client king of Babylon. Meanwhile, he selected his younger son, the scholarly Ashurbanipal, as his heir to the throne of Assyria. Shamash was displeased with this, and after Ashurbanipal's ascension to the throne, he rose up in rebellion against his brother, using Babylon as his new center of power. Despite the blood relation, Ashurbanipal proved no less harsh on rebels than his predecessors. Babylon was besieged once again, this time for two years, before falling to the Assyrians once more. It was another massacre. In one inscription, Ashurbanipal describes his treatment of the bodies of dead Babylonians. Their carved up bodies I fed to dogs, to pigs, to wolves, to eagles, to birds of the heavens, to fishes of the deep. Sources conflict over how exactly Shamash died, but most sources mention fire in some capacity. To kill a brother was a grave crime in Assyrian law, but even that did not save the rebel from his brutal punishment. The Assyrians are perhaps best known today for the role they play in the Old Testament. Using the Bible as a historical source is tricky, but enough evidence exists to corroborate plenty of what the Bible says about the Assyrians. Assyria's reputation for cruelty owes much to the biblical accounts, which shaped the perceptions of Assyria long before modern archaeology rediscovered how to read their inscriptions. The Bible mentions Assyria about 150 times, and it is usually seen as a force for evil. 
In 732 BC, Tiglath Pilazar III waged war on the Kingdom of Israel, annexing the northern half of the territory and imposing tribute on the Kingdom of Judah. As part of this conquest, Tiglath Pilazar had much of the population in these newly conquered regions relocated. This population included the people now known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. These peoples were resettled elsewhere in the empire and presumably assimilated into their new cultures while shedding their original faith. The fate of the Lost Tribes has fascinated religious scholars, believers, and historians for millennia. Numerous groups claim to be descended from these Lost Tribes. Wherever they ended up, the Assyrians were ultimately responsible for taking them away, which enshrined the Assyrian as enemies of Judaism and, by extension, the other Abrahamic faiths. Around 702 BC, Sennacherib II launched another campaign against King Hezekiah of Judah, inflicting a number of atrocities on cities that he conquered. At Lashish in 701 BC, the town was almost completely depopulated. Its citizens were deported, and reliefs, also in the British Museum, show the city's leaders being flayed. This fate might have been expected for Jerusalem, which was besieged by Assyrian forces around the same time, but eventually Sennacherib withdrew. The Bible claims that an angel descended upon the Assyrians and wiped out 185,000 of them. But more likely, Sennacherib withdrew because Hezekiah had offered to pay tribute and he had little to gain by besieging Jerusalem any longer. These events have been seen as important for Jewish identity and the formation of the national identities of Judah and Israel. The Assyrians were the great other against which these groups defined themselves, and it is unsurprising that Assyria's reputation through history has been colored by the Bible's hostility to them. Non-biblical sources seem to confirm, even exceed, the level of brutality attested in the Bible. Some historians argue that the Assyrians weren't any more brutal than any other empires throughout history. They point to countless depictions of the Egyptian pharaohs executing captives with a mace, to Romans lining their roads with crucified victims, or as Aztecs ripping out hearts as sacrifices to the gods. It is certainly true that the Assyrians were brutal, but whether they are truly more brutal than others, or just more honest about it, is a topic historians still debate over. Eventually, the Assyrian Empire collapsed. The Babylonians, who had suffered so much under the empire, defeated Assyria on the battlefield. Meanwhile, the Medes, once a small kingdom on the fringes of the empire, rose up and forged their own great empire after attacking Assur in 615 BC. Much of the same brutality wielded by the Assyrians now turned on them and condemned them to the graveyard of history. Although Assyria fell, its legacy lives on. In museums across the world, Artifacts attest to the might and mercilessness of the once great empire and the diabolical punishments it handed out to those that dared to displease them. If you don't want to displease us, then we'll be kind enough not to punish you, but we would appreciate it if you'd give a like to this video and subscribe to our channel.